What an amazing day filled with incredible ideas. So, where do these ideas come from? This is a question that I have been pondering for the last 35 years. Where do ideas come from? I started out as a neurophysiologist, poking little tiny cells with even tinier electrodes, seeing what they would tell me about creativity and innovation. After I finished my PhD, I went out to study and sort of learn all about creativity in the wild, working in big companies and small companies, even starting my own. And for the last almost 13 years, I've been at Stanford teaching classes on creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship. And in my classes, I've done endless experiments with my students, trying to figure out what is involved with unlocking creativity. What I've realized over the last few years is that we look at creativity in much too narrow a way. We really need to open the aperture and look at creativity in a very different light. And what I've done is put together a model that I'm going to basically explain to you in the next few minutes about all the things we need to unlock creativity. And I want to point out, before I take it apart, that this innovation engine, that's what I call it, has two parts. The inside is you, your knowledge, your imagination, your attitude. And the outside is the outside world, the resources, the habitat, and the culture. So let's start. Let's start where most people start. Most people start thinking about creativity by thinking about imagination. So let's start there. Now, imagination, one of the sad things is that we don't really teach people how to increase their imagination in school. And so there really are ways to increase our ability to come up with really interesting ideas. We have to go back to kindergarten to see where the problem is. If you're in kindergarten, it's very likely you'll get a question like this. What is the sum of 5 plus 5? So what's the answer to this? 10. You guys are really smart, right? OK, we know it's 10 because there's one right answer to this problem. But what if we ask this question in a slightly different way? What if we ask, what two numbers add up to 10? How many answers are this to this? Infinite. Infinite number. And this is critically important and something that many of the speakers have brought up today, is that the way you ask the question determines the type of answers you get. The question you ask is the frame into which the answers will fall. And if you don't ask the question in a thoughtful way, you're not going to get really interesting answers. Consider the fact that the Copernican Revolution came about by reframing the question, what if the Earth is not the center of the solar system? What if the sun is? And that opened up the entire study of astronomy. But you know what? You don't have to do this in such a serious way. You can practice it every single day with jokes. Because most jokes that we tell are interesting because the frame switches in the middle of the joke. Consider this, the Pink Panther, if you've seen this movie, he walks into a hotel, there's a little dog sitting on the carpet, he says to the hotel manager, uh, does your dog bite? And the manager says, no, my dog doesn't bite. He reaches down, the dog basically attacks him, he says, what happened? He says, well, that's not my dog. <laughs> Think about it, whenever you hear a joke, you will find that almost always it's that the frame is switched in the middle, and it's a really fun way to practice framing and reframing problems. So that's one of the ways that you can increase your imagination. But there are other ways. One of the key ways is to connect and combine ideas. Most inventions in the world, most innovations come from putting things together that haven't been there together before, often in really unusual and surprising ways. One of my favorite ways to practice this is with the Japanese art of shindogu. Shindogu is the art of creating unuseless inventions. They're not useful. They're not useless. They're unuseless. And what they really are is a way of saying, there might be something here, but I'm not quite sure. So in this example with uh, the umbrellas on the shoes, well, gee, it might not be very practical, but it unlocks some really, really interesting ideas. Speaking of shoes, here's another shindogu. OK, little dust pants. Again, it might not be practical, but you know what? There's an interesting idea there. Again. You can use jokes for inspiration every single day. One of my favorite things, whenever I get the New Yorker, and I'm sure anyone who reads the New Yorker knows, the first thing you do is you open up the back cover and you look at the, the cartoon caption contest. The cartoon caption contest always 
puts things together that are not obvious, often things that are out of scale or things that would be very, very surprising to have in the same frame. And your job is to come up with a really creative way to connect these things in really interesting and surprising ways. So here's the caption for this cartoon. It is, we'll start you out here, then give you more responsibilities as you gain experience. Now, of course, you could come up with an endless number of other solutions. So those are two ways for you to increase your imagination, but there's another that I want to bring up today, and that is challenging assumptions. One of the biggest problems we have is that when we ask people questions and give them problems, they come up with the first right answer. So we end up getting really incremental solutions. So what we do in our creativity class is we give problems that are really surprising where there is not one right answer. So here's an example of one I just gave recently. This is the exact design brief. Um, I gave this actually to a group of students at Osaka University. And uh, their challenge was to create as much value as possible, value measured in any way they wanted, starting with the contents of one trash can. They had two hours to do it. How'd you like that to do that? One of the interesting things about this assignment, and I put a lot of thought into framing the problem beforehand, is that trash is actually worth, has negative value, right? We actually pay people to take it away. So what happened is these students ended up spending quite a bit of time in advance of diving into the project thinking about what value meant for them. They thought about friendship and community and health and financial security, all sorts of things that ended up informing the way they thought about the trash cans that they were going to use to create some value. To raise the bar even further, I gave them uh, a little bit more of a challenge. I told them that I had sent a note out, which I did, to my colleagues around the world and invited their students to participate at the same time. So there were students in Europe, in Asia, in the US, and in Latin America, all doing the same project at the same time. So let me show you a couple of the things that resulted from this. A group in Ecuador started out with a garbage can filled with yard waste. Yard waste, I probably wouldn't have picked that trash can, but look how what amazing thing they did. They turned it into a beautiful mural. Or a girl in Ireland, her mom had just gone through her brother's sock drawer and had a whole trash can of old holy socks. You know what she did? They were all different colors, black, white, gray. She cut them up, sewed them together, and made this sweater. Pretty cool. I hope some of you will go through your sock drawers later today. So these are three things you can do to increase your imagination, right? Framing and reframing problems, connecting, combining ideas, and challenging assumptions. But unfortunately, this is not enough. You need to look at the other pieces of the innovation engine. And one of the next pieces on the inside is your knowledge. Your knowledge is the toolbox for your imagination. Today we heard all about medical um, breakthroughs and about autonomous vehicles. And why, how could they make this? These folks needed a depth of knowledge about medicine or about engineering to bring these ideas to life. Now of course you can learn things by going to school, by reading books, but one of the most powerful ways to learn things and to gain knowledge is by paying attention. Most of us do not pay attention to the world around us. Not only do we miss opportunities to see problems we can solve, but we also miss the solutions that might be in front of us. And one of my favorite ways to, to teach students this is to send them out into locations they've been to many times before and get them to look at them with fresh eyes. But I'm not the only one who does this. I want to tell you a quick story about a friend of mine, Bob Siegel, who's a professor here at Stanford, who taught a Stanford, a Stanford um, sophomore seminar for two weeks, and it was called the Stanford Safari. And the students basically over two weeks acted as if they were naturalists, as if they were just like Darwin and the Galapagos, but they were on the Stanford campus. And they talked to everyone they could to give a different point of view and perspective about Stanford, from the groundskeepers and the pest controller to the librarians and the organists and all the living Stanford presidents. They walked away not just with a deep understanding of Stanford, but an incredible appreciation for how important it is to pay attention. But imagination and knowledge are not enough. Every person needs to have the attitude the mindset, the motivation, the drive to solve the problems they're going to solve. If you don't have that drive and that motivation, you're not going to connect and combine ideas. You're not going to reframe problems. You're not going to challenge assumptions and go beyond the first right answer. Most people, unfortunately, view themselves as puzzle builders. They basically see themselves as having a very defined task 
And their job is to get all the pieces and put them together to reach that goal. But what happens? If you're a puzzle builder and you're missing one or two pieces, what happens? You can't reach your goal. True innovators, true entrepreneurs actually see themselves as quilt makers. They basically take all the resources they have around them. They leverage the things, even the garbage can, right? They leverage the materials they have that, they're avail that are available to them and create something that is surprising and really fascinating. This is incredibly important. We have to view ourselves as, as those who can leverage the resources we have around us to really make amazing things happen. So this is our internal combustion engine for creativity. Our knowledge is a toolbox for our creativity. Our imagination is the catalyst for the transformation of that knowledge into new ideas. And our attitude is the spark that gets this going. But unfortunately, that's not enough. And it's one of the reasons why there are so many amazingly creative people who are basically not living up to their creative potential. Because they're not in environments that foster and stimulate and encourage this type of innovation. So we have to look at the outside of the innovation engine. Let's start first by looking at habitats. Now habitats include several things. It's certainly the people you work with. It's the rules. It's the rewards. It's the constraints. It's the incentives. But even more than that, it's the physical space. Consider the fact that when we're little, when we're kids, we go to kindergartens. They're stimulating environments. You walk in, you know it's a place you're supposed to be creative. It's colorful. There are a lot of manipulatives. You are, the room is very flexible. But unfortunately, you graduate from this type of environment, and you get to go study somewhere like this. <laughs> the chairs are lined up in rows and columns. They're bolted to the floor. And if you talk to anybody, you get in trouble. I have to tell you, I spent my entire growing up writing silence is golden, silence is golden, okay? And the fact is we then get very upset because the students, you know, they're just not so creative anymore and everyone laments that. And then they are successful in this environment and they go off to this environment where they work. And I know why you're laughing because it's all too familiar. These type of offices were designed to be like prisons. And unfortunately, what happens is we again get very frustrated that the people who are working in these type of environments are not very creative. The thing is, the space we're in tells a story. Every space is the stage on which we play off our life. And it tells us what role we play, how we should act. I'm fortunate enough to teach at the D School, and these are actually some pictures from my class. Now, it might look like the kids are back in kindergarten. They're actually working on a very sophisticated problem here, as are the students in this picture. But the room is much more like a kindergarten space with lots of manipulatives, lots of things to prototype. The room is set up, it's like a, a theater. We can set it up differently every five minutes depending upon what we want to do. Nothing is bolted down. Really innovative firms know this as well. This is a picture from uh, Google and Zurich. This is a picture from Pixar. These are not frivolous because these are messages that the company is giving to the employees that's saying innovation, creativity, and playfulness are valued here. But this is not enough. We also have to think about the resources we have in our environment. And resources come in so many different flavors. Unfortunately, we think of resources as things like money. And money is a fabulous resource. We certainly benefit from it here at Stanford and Silicon Valley. But it's one of many resources that we have available to us. We need to look at the natural resources. We have to look at the processes we put in place. We have to look at the cultures we build. Unfortunately, I get a chance um, to see this happening in different places of the world. I, I was up in northern Chile recently, and it was absolutely spectacularly gorgeous up in the north of Chile. You know, the beach was endless. It's 3,000 mile beach, and the Andes are there. And I said to the people in this town of Alta Augusta, gee, what's really getting in the way of your success? And this man said to me, well, it's a really horrible environment. I said, really? Did you look outside? Because they didn't see, they were trying to replicate the resources someone had somewhere else, as opposed to seeing the resources they already had. So here, picture of this city, think of the culture there. Culture is important. Culture is the last piece of the innovation engine. Culture is like the background music of any community, of any organization, of every team, of every family. And I'm going to play you two video clips to demonstrate this. Think of the music in these video clips as the culture in each of these scenes. 
I'm going to play the same clip twice. This is a clip from 1919 Coca-Cola Bottling Factory, OK? And I want you to think about how you feel, whether you would want to be there, and what you think is in those bottles. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. Okay, you got the point, right? So the fact is, this is the outside of your innovation engine. But let's put it all together. Now you might say, okay, Tina, that's really interesting, but how come you have this fancy Mobius strip here? You could have just had an inside and outside. But it's a Mobius strip because the inside and the outside are completely woven together, and nothing can be looked at in isolation. Let me show you how. Imagination and habitat are parallel here. Because the habitats we build are the external manifestation of our imagination. If you can't imagine it, you can't build it. And in addition, the habitats we build directly affect our imagination, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. This is also true with knowledge and resources. The more we know, the more resources we can unlock. And the more we resource, the type of resources we have determine what we know, right? The more we know about fishing, the more fish we're going to catch. The more fish we have in our environment, the more likely we know about fishing. This is also true with attitude and culture. Culture is the collective attitudes of the community, and the culture clearly affects how each of us thinks. The wonderful thing, though, is this Mobius strip of the innovation engine is so powerful that you can start anywhere. If you're the manager of an organization, you can set up you can think about the culture and set the culture. You can build habitats that stimulate the imagination. If you're an individual, you can start by building your base of knowledge. You can start with a passion and attitude that you're going to solve a problem. You can start anywhere to get this innovation going. The most important thing is that everyone, everyone has the key to their innovation engine. It's up to them to turn it. Thank you. <laughs>